I got saved when I was six years old in 1969. So you can start adding up how old I am. I'm sorry about that. I don't like telling my age. But in 1969, I got saved at six years old. Uh, there was a revival. And my aunt, who just died about a month ago, and uh, her death just brought all these memories back about my salvation. My aunt invited my mom to the revival. Back then, my dad had nothing to do with religion and would, just inviting him would be, you know, a good way to get your head bit off. Did invite my mom. Of course, she took us with her. And the first time I was ever in church, six years old, 1969. Do not know the preacher's name. Uh, I do know the pastor's name later, but this was an evangelist. And someday I want to look for the white haired man. That's all I remember him as. He had white hair. When we get to heaven, I want to look for that white haired man and thank him. I was six years old. He began to preach and it was a, a revival meeting and uh, he began to preach on heaven and hell. By the way, I've been told several times and uh, I disagree with. People say, don't preach or teach with, uh, kids about hell. It'll scare them. That's how I got saved. So you're talking to the wrong person. He was preaching on heaven and hell. And I didn't know any Bible, never been to church my entire life. But one thing I knew for sure, I wanted to go to the heaven place. I did not want to go to hell. He preached on sin at six years old. You did not have to convince me that I was a bad person. I had, I did things. Uh, I can't tell you all the stories I did, even by six years old. Uh, I, I think I, if I had been born in the 80s or 90s, they would have had me on medication. That's, that's how wild I was back in the day. My mom had to take the playpen, you know, remember the old playpens, the wooden ones, and she would turn it upside down and put me in it. It was like I was in prison because she couldn't handle me. She couldn't stop me from getting out. And I even figured out how to get out of that. I even figured out how to get out of baby prison. Uh, one time I got up one morning and my mom uh, had bought uh, 12 dozen eggs, right? Yeah, 144 eggs to color in some some kind of women's thing she was doing and it was Easter time and she was going to boil them and color them and all things. I saw all of those eggs in the refrigerator and I figured that would be cool to use as bombs. So I'm out in the backyard and I'm throwing them all over the yard. I'm throwing them at the neighbor's yard. I'm throwing them at garages. And she finally wakes up and sees me out in the backyard and all the eggs that she had bought were just everywhere. You did not have to convince me at six years old that I was a sinner. I knew I'd done wrong. And because of that, that preacher was telling me I deserved hell. His description of hell made sure, made me sure that I did not want to go there. And so there was an invitation. And I turned to my mom and I said, I want to go. My mom says, no, you're too young. You're too young. We came a second night and the preacher was preaching. I don't know what he preached on because you know what was still in my heart and mind? Heaven or hell. Invitation came and I tugged on my mom and I told my mom, I want to go. She said, Mikey, by the way, nobody is allowed to call me Mikey, okay? <laughs> she said, Mikey, you're too young. You don't understand this. We went a third night and before, well, actually that second night, we're going through and, you know, you at the end, you know, the pastor and evangelist is there and you shake their hands, you're leaving the door. My mom's going through with me and uh, she says to the pastor, she says, he keeps bothering me about going forward in the invitation. What should I do? Pastor says, bless his soul. Pastor says, he's too young. There's no way he understands. He's just too young. The evangelist, thank God, heard the conversation. Said, tomorrow, come tomorrow. If he asks again, let him come and let me talk to him. 
We went back the third day. I still don't know what he was preaching about. But I turned to my mom at invitation. I said, I want to go. She said, go. And it scared me because she kept saying no before. And so I waited one more song. They had one more song. And I remember being scared to death. And I pulled out of that pew and, and the aisle. And it's, if you've never experienced this, it's like tunnel vision. All you can see is you and that preacher. And it was like, it was probably an auditorium as big as this, but it seemed like I walked a mile. And I got up there. And he, he kneels down. Awesome, man. I don't. He kneels down and says, Mikey, why'd you come forward? And I'm thinking, what am I going to tell? The only thing I could think of is, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. He says, all right, let me show you how. And he took the Bible and he went through the Romans road, which I use today, the same thing. And he showed me how to accept Christ as my savior at six years old. Don't think that kids don't grasp hold of these things. They can and they will. They understand faith. They understand strength. They understand heaven. They understand hell. The gospel is easy enough for a child to get and understand. It's simple enough. Salvation is simple enough. So simple that even a child can grasp it and understand it. I didn't know anything about the Trinity, the second coming of the Lord, uh, you know, uh, baptism, Lord, I didn't know any of that stuff. Matter of fact, I remember the first time the pastor said, we're going to have Lord's Supper on Sunday night. I came prepared to eat. I was so disappointed. It was this little piece of bread and this little cup. And I'm look, I looked at my mom and says, who eats this? I actually asked that. Didn't know any of that. But I knew I was a sinner and I knew I deserved hell and I wanted to go to heaven. And so that's why children's ministries are so important to me. I feel it and I know that children can grasp things much more than we give them credit for. To me, there is so, no one too young. If they understand, they understand. God's the same way. Let's read through here, Jeremiah Chapter one, verse four. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I adorned thee, ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I. Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Here it is, Jeremiah was a boy. We don't know the exact age, but if you look it up in the Greek, don't you hate it when people do that? It says young person, young, and it even says boy. Odds are he was probably younger than a teenager, maybe a little older. Preteen. And here he is, God speaking to him. Now, I want to tell you, if I'm in my bedroom or I'm out someplace and this voice talks out of nowhere, I'm not calling it Lord God. I'm running. I'm out of there. But he was so in tune with God. He was so, uh, can I say the word spiritual? He was so in fellowship with God that when God spoke to him, he knew exactly who it was. As a child. And God says. I am going to use you. As a prophet. To the nations. As a child. Now of course. He did most of his work. When he was older. But he calls him. When he's a child. God. Uses children. Throughout the scripture. 
And we're going to study some of those. He uses children throughout Scripture. Again, to prove the point just with David. It's not about you, who you are, how smart you are, how strong you are, how much experience you have. It's all about our God. And he can use anyone who's willing. I like the story about when God used a donkey. He used a donkey to talk for him. If God can use a donkey, and I'm cleaning up the words, if God can use a donkey, he can use you. It's not about you. And even poor old Jeremiah says, God, how can this be? I'm a child. I'm just a boy. I'm not. A, who's going to listen to me? I'm not a very good speaker. I don't know what I'm doing. And God says, don't call yourself just a child because I'm your strength. Put your faith in me. A child can do great things if their faith is in God. Well, what do you mean, Michael? I told you about my dad. My dad had no inkling, no desire for anything about church, God, anything like that. Uh, my dad uh, was the kind of guy who spent Fridays or Saturdays out at the bar. He's not here to defend himself. Or he, would, he would tell you. Just a normal, everyday man. Religion and all that was for little children and women. It's not for a man. Yeah, you can go to church if you want. Leave me alone. I get saved and we start going to church because I'm a Christian now. And that's what Christians do, by the way. They go to church. I knew that at a very young age. How else I was going to learn about God. And so my mom would go to church and my sisters and we would go to church. Eventually, all my sisters got saved. And we'd go Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, just me and my mom and my sisters. One Sunday, we're getting ready to go and dad's doing his normal Sunday stuff. And I went up to dad and I said, you know what, dad? Six days out of the week, I have a dad. But on Sundays, I don't. He said, what? I said, you never go to church with us. And when we get home, you're not here. I don't have a dad on Sundays. Wow. And so my dad said, you know what? I'm going to go with you and the kids to church today because of what Mikey said. And dad went. And after we're leaving, we're going to shake hands. And I told the pastor as we're shaking hands, I said, I'm so happy. And my dad's standing there. And I said, I'm so happy today. And he goes, why are you so happy? I said, because on Sunday, I finally have a dad. And so dad started coming to church because of what I said, because I wanted him to be with us. And within a few weeks, the pastor came to our house, began to talk to my dad, and my dad became a Christian. Because of the word of a boy. I was so excited about being a Christian and I wanted everyone to get saved. I began to tell other kids in the neighborhood and I would tell them about sin and about heaven and hell. That's all I knew. So much so that one of the mothers called my mom and said, could you please tell Michael to quit telling people that they're going to hell if they don't get saved? It's scaring the children. God uses who's ever willing, even children. You don't know what we have back there. We don't know what kind of future those kids have for God. If they put their faith and their trust in him and are willing to be used, great things will happen. By the way, we can decide today to do the same thing as adults. You know, I'm going to put my faith and my trust and I'm going to allow God to use me any way he wants. And great things will happen. I know it's not the sermon. I'm going 
I'm going, I'm going wild now, okay? I'm off script. Uh, you guys have it. You can read through, and we might hit some of these. I remember as I grew as a Christian, and I hit my teenage years, and it became more and more uh, of a struggle in your teen years to live for God, and it's the truth. Uh, public school is not easy for Christians. Public school is not easy for Christians. I'm not saying you can't do it, can't say that you're not strong. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying it's not easy. And of course, there was the pool of the world and, and the pool of Christ and the constant conflict. And I remember, again, another revival. It was actually not a revival. It was a missionary conference. And in the missionary conference, God kept calling me to be a missionary. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. Missionaries have to live in the jungle. It's, uh, you know, high. Some of them get eaten. I can't handle that. No, no. Finally, uh, and dad, can, dad didn't know about this till later on in life. It, we didn't have any air conditioning in our house. That was back in the day when some places had air conditioning, some didn't. I didn't even know if central air existed back then. Uh, who knows? But we didn't have air conditioning. And sometimes I would crawl out my bedroom window on the second floor and sleep on the roof because it was cooler outside than in the house. Can you believe that? And I would sleep out there sometimes and then I'd wake up in the middle of the night and go back inside. I was sleeping out there one night and I looked up to the stars and I saw the vast of all the universe. And finally, I said to God, as a teenager, about 15, because I wasn't driving yet, I said, God, whatever you want me to be, I'll be. I remember saying this exactly. Let me say, God, all my life, I wanted my parents to be proud of me. I'm not even worried about that anymore, God. I hope you have conversations like this with God where you're just open and raw. Said, I'm not even worried about my mom and dad being proud of me anymore. I want you proud of me, God. And whatever you want me to be, even if it's a missionary in the deepest jungles, I'll do it. And then God says, I don't want you to be a missionary. Whew, thank God. Thank God he didn't want just wanted me to be willing. God uses children all through Scripture. God uses anyone who's willing. God says to him in verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. It says, you will go. I don't care if you're a child. I'm going to use you. Verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdom to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. And so here he is. God comes to Jeremiah as a child, says, I've got a plan for you. I've got a I'm going to have you be a prophet. And he says, I'm a child. And he says, don't say that because it's not about you, Jeremiah. I got a plan for you. So let's look at these six things we know. And I know the time and I'll go through them real fast. OK, six things we know about every child. Six things we know about every child. Every child is created by God before I formed thee in the belly, he says. Uh, there's so much I want to say about this and I could stay here forever. Every 
child is created by God. But somebody will say, and most of us are adults here, what about rape and incest? God formed that child? Every child is formed by God. Had a lady, matter of fact, it was in the back of my house. She worked uh, at a convenience store and there was this field behind my house. And I didn't know this, but as she was leaving work one night, somebody grabbed her, took her to the field behind my house and raped her. And she becomes pregnant. Now she's a Christian. And she understands that every child is formed by God. And many a person had told her, even some Christians whispered to her, you can have that aborted. I don't have to live with that. But she knew that God formed that child and she kept her baby. And I love this. Her last name was Love. And she named her baby Christian. Christian Love. So it would be a testimony throughout everybody and throughout the city and wherever she goes. Christian love is what we show even in horrible times, horrible messes. Every child is formed by God. And because of that, every child is known by God. It says, I knew thee before I formed thee, before you existed in your mother's womb. I know you. I knew you. The Bible says that Jesus know, says God knows us so well. Jesus said that he knows how many hairs are in our head. And, and some of us have le right. Some of us have less than we had. Uh, there was a day I was proud of my hair. Nowadays, you know, not so much. Uh, knows every hair in our head. If he knows every hair in our head, he knows us so well. God knows your child better than you know your child. God knows you better than you know you. God knew you before he created you. It's an amazing thing. Every child is created by God. Every child is known by God. Every child is unique by God's plan. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That word sanctified means set apart. That means you're different than others. By the way, we're all set apart. We're all different. We're all unique. If you don't know that, try to have three or four kids. How many of you guys have? Four. They're all different, aren't they? I mean, there's some similarities here and there, but they're all different. You'll have three that likes broccoli and one that just despise it and will die if they eat it. You'll have one that's real quiet and the other, another one that just won't shut up. You'll have some that like sports and others like, ooh, why is that on? I remember one time I was watching, uh, what was I watching? Baseball. And my little girl came and she sat in my lap and she looked up and saw the baseball and she goes, didn't we already see this? She thought it was a rerun. Uh, they're all different. They're all unique. God created them. God knows them. And they're all unique for a reason. Every unique thing that we have is for God's purpose and plan in our life. My son here, Justin, one of his unique things was bugs. I remember one time I went to go pick him up at the boys club. Boys clubs, girl clubs now, I think they call it. I went to go pick him up at the boys club. And they came out to me and they said, we're a little worried about Justin. Now, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I heard that, Justin. I said, why? He goes, all he wants to do all day. He won't, he won't play bumper pool. He won't do this. He, won't do, he just goes out in the fields and catch bugs. That's what he likes to do. By the way, if you want to ask anybody anything about bugs, there's your man. I'll be out, I'll be out walking and he'll go, oh, that's a da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I'm like, dude, really? <laughs> Don't pick that up. It's going to bite you. What? <laughs> he knows your bugs. You got people who like rocks. 
I could kick a rock is a rock to me. You have some people you dig it up and they say, <gasps> and they go wild about rocks. Right now, his big thing is, you know, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh cards and all that. And that makes him unique. That's what he likes to do. I don't understand it. I tried to understand it. I can't get it, can I? I just don't understand it. It's okay. He's unique. And so am I. And so are you. Every child is unique. One of the things, the challenge of a, of a parent is not to try to make them like you. They're not you. They're not going to. None of my kids played sports. A little bit. Jonathan played baseball. I had him play one year of football, not because I was trying to live through him, but there was a lesson to learn through that. But besides that, my kids don't like sports. I'm a huge sports guy. That's all I ever did. I played baseball in high school and basketball in college. I, I played one year of semi-pro baseball, hoping that I could catch on. And I just love sports. Not one of my kids. You Can you imagine the disaster if I forced them to be like me? Because they can't be. Every child's unique. That's why it's uh, one of the beauties of a parent who grasps hold of this is you don't always discipline the same way either. Jonathan, when he was younger, if I just said to him, I'm disappointed in you, the man would, well, he's a man now, the boy would start crying and say, I'm sorry, dad, please forgive me. We were fixed. We got, we worked it out. Justin made me beat him. He couldn't get it. He didn't care. <laughs> Different, unique. Even when you discipline, even some are more responsible than others. And yeah, maybe you're driving at 16, but no, you're going to wait till you're 18. Well, why? Because you're not responsible enough. And it's okay to be that way because they're unique. Every child is unique by God's plan. Every child has a purpose by God's plan. God uses that uniqueness to fulfill his purpose in their lives, by the way. And he has a purpose for every child. I adore, uh, ordained you. I have called you to this ministry and for this purpose. Every child, every Christian has a ministry. God has a ministry for every Christian. It's just whether we're going to submit to it or not. God has a purpose for every child. A purpose for every child. There is no such thing as we have too many people in the earth. I don't know where that came from. I, I don't know why. I think it's evil. We're not going to overpopulate. It's not going to happen. God has a purpose and a plan for every unique child. Number five, every child has a chance to succeed because of God's presence. Every child has a chance to succeed because God is with them. Being not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. I am with you. And because I'm with you, you have a chance to succeed. I will deliver you. Again, it's about our faith and our, sub, our submission. But if even a child who submits to God, they will be successful. Children can be successful in school based on their submission to God. Children can be successful to, to be what they want to be in life, their goal in life, based on their submission to God. Because God says, I am with you to deliver you. Don't be afraid about what I called you to do. Just like the story of David. All three of us admitted we'd be scared and gone. David wasn't afraid, not because of his own strength, not because of his own power, but because of the strength uh, that God gives to him. Because of his faith in God, he knew he didn't have to be afraid because God was with him and would deliver him and he was successful. Every child can be successful. Number six, by the way, don't call your children losers and lazy and good for nothing. 
they remember those things. Be more encouraging. Remember, every child can be successful. And if you really want to help them and they're not being successful, talk to them about their spiritual life. Yeah, but, you know, what the problem is, is they're not doing very well in school. They're not studying. They're not applying themselves. So that's what I got to fix. Odds are they got a problem with their spiritual life. And encourage them that way. Talk to them about their relationship with God. Because God is with them. And if God is with you, you will be successful. Now, again, being unique, Justin was successful at C's. He was. Justin brought home a B. Dude, we had a party. But I knew he tried his best and he got C's. Jonathan, if he got a B, I'm going to him and saying, what's going on? What's wrong? Because he could, he could just sleep through class and get an A. See the uniqueness? But every child could be successful. Number six, every child has a God-given talent. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. He, every child has a talent. They're unique and they have a talent. Whatever that talent is, some are good singers, some are good organizers, some are good speakers. And you begin to see it really at a young age. The organizers, they're organizing the room all the time, aren't they? Moving things around, trying to make it better. You walk into their room and their bed's over here and over there. And they're, what are you doing? I'm organizing my room. I'm setting up my room. And God gave them that talent. They see it. See, that's not really a talent I have. I'll look and I'll say, everything's fine. And it'll be the same way for 30 years. Uh, thank God for women, or we would never get rid of that couch. Or, you know, men will wear the same shirt forever. The other day I had a shirt that ripped and it was time to throw it away. And I started almost crying because I've had that shirt since the 90s. That's a man. But everybody has been given a talent. As you notice, my wife, she likes to decorate. She did the wreath. She, that's a talent I don't have. She has. And God expects her to use that talent for him. Every child has a talent. And it's our job as parents to encourage that talent to be used for the Lord and help them with that talent, whatever it may be. Again, each one's unique. One will have a different talent than the other, but encourage it and help it flourish. I like Jeremiah 29, 11. You see it on posters. You see it on boards, but it really ties in well with this. And then we'll be done. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And if we put in our children here, we can say, for I know the thoughts that the child that God has towards my child. I know that he has thoughts towards my child. Say it to the Lord, thoughts of peace. So he wants peace for my child. Not of evil to give an expected end, a successful end, a hopeful end. So God wants to bring peace to my child and he wants to bring success to my child. And I know that's what God wants. And me as a parent, as a grandparent, should look at their uniqueness, look at their talents, knowing that God created them, knowing that God has a purpose for them in their lives, and I should encourage whatever those talents are and whatever those uniqueness are, because God is going to use those for something successful and great someday. By the way, adults, so do we. God wants to use you with the talents you have and the uniqueness that you have for ministry. I love ministry-minded church members. Men, ministry-minded church because that's the kind of person that's in tune with God. That's the kind of church that's in tune with God because God gave us everything to be used for him. And we should be doing it. Let us close in prayer.